Good day. This is Prof. David speaking. Welcome to this presentation on writing a postgraduate research proposal. Okay, so I've decided to present this uh, lecture to assist those students who are struggling to write a research proposal. Over the years, I've seen many masters and PhD students struggle to write a research proposal. Hence, I've decided to present this lecture. Okay, so we are going to start from the beginning. And the first question that I'm going to pose is what is a research proposal? As you may know that a research proposal is a document that details a proposed research project. Okay? So if you want to embark on a research project, you need to come up with a research proposal. So the purpose of such a project is to contribute to new knowledge or to solve socioeconomic problems. In other words, these are the reasons why we conduct researches. Okay, so why write a research proposal? What are the circumstances that will compel you to write a research proposal? Okay, at some point, there will be a need to write a research proposal. So we look at those instances where you'll be compelled to write a research proposal. The first one is research funding application. Okay, so in this case, you are applying for a funding, for research funding. Okay, so you normally make an application to the funding body, okay? So which means you write a research proposal in the form of an application and send to a funding body. So it is essential to know that such an application, such an application will be subjected to an assessment process and a selection process whereby only suitable and meritorious applicants will be awarded the funds. So most of the times, the funds cannot be shared to everyone. So a few will be selected. So when you are writing a research proposal for, fund, for funding, you have to be meticulous. Your proposal has to be top notch. Okay, so that, that is one instance where you, you are required to write a research proposal. The second instance where you are required to write a research proposal, sometimes it's for admission. When you are applying for admission to, to do a postgraduate uh, program, either a master's or a PhD, okay? The university will require you to send some sort of a draft proposal to reflect your uh, research uh, field of your research field, yeah, or to reflect your research interest or the area of specialization. So just for them to understand where you are and where you want to go. And also in this instance, there will be an assessment because when students are applying for admission, many students all over the world are applying to a particular university and the university cannot select everyone Okay, they cannot take in everyone. So that university will have to do a selection. So they will assess those draft proposal and select suitable and meritorious applicants for admission. This is together with the academic uh, qualifications and, uh, and transcripts. So they're also going to look at your undergraduate 
performance. So in addition to that, they also look at, they also assess the draft proposal that you've submitted. So it's, it's important to take note. Then the last reason why one can write a research proposal will be at the onset of your master's or your PhD research. In this instance, you've been admitted into a postgraduate program and surely you've been allocated a supervisor. So under the guidance of your supervisor, you'll be required to write a research proposal, which will mark the beginning of your master's or PhD research. So those are the three instances where you'll be required to write a research proposal. Okay. I will say that M and D research proposal is very important because if you are fumbling, if you are inapt in writing a research proposal, your admission can be terminated on grounds of lack of progress or poor performance. So it's very important that students should be aware that when you're admitted into a master's or a PhD program, you have to do well at the proposal level. Because if you can write a proposal, that simply means that you will not be able to do such a research. So this is a warning to all those who are not taking their research proposal seriously. Okay. Sometimes before you write a research proposal, you need a research topic. Some students are fortunate because they will get the topics or they will get a topic from their supervisor. Okay. Sometimes you are joining a research project, a big research project that is ongoing in a faculty or in a department. So when you join the project, you meet a research topic or you meet a research topics that are available and you are slotted into one of such topic. But that is not the case for every student. Some students, we need to have a topic before they even apply for admission. Or you will need a topic before you apply for funding. Okay, remember most often you apply for research funding while you are st still aspiring to gain an admission into the university. So sometimes you go to the university with the funds that are uh, all with a buzzer that has been allocated to you. So there are different dynamics when it comes to this. But the bottom line is for you to get a research topic, you must do the following things that I'm going to discuss. Sometimes you, you, you could have been admitted into a master's program or a PhD program with a topic, but the supervisor may decide to change that topic. And then you find yourself in this scenario to come up with a new research topic. So now we're going to look at how to come up with a research topic. Okay, so like we've seen in the, in the previous slide, that we do research to solve socioeconomic problems or to, 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 to create new knowledge in the research field. So for you to do research, you must probe where there are knowledge gaps or where there are problems so that you can do a research and, and look for solution to that uh, problem. So, now we, we need to read uh, uh, literature, okay? You need to read published articles, you know, to get a, a, a feel of what is going on in that particular research area. So you read a lot of publication in that particular research area. And then from there, you are going to map out problem, uh, research problems that you want to tackle. 
okay? It could be a problem that is experienced in, in one region or in one country, and you feel that such a, a, a problem is prevailing in another country, then you want to see how you want to tackle that problem in that particular country. So that is the purpose of reading broad uh, of doing a broad based uh, literature review. Okay. So you, you conduct a broad based literature review, you review accredited, accredited academic journals. Okay. You review articles in accredited academic journals that are relevant to your research field. Okay, so when you are reading, what are you looking for? You are looking for knowledge gaps and research problems. Problems that you think you can tackle by conducting a research. Gap areas that you think you can resolve by conducting a research. Okay, so you, 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 you take down the problem statement so in, you try to formulate the problem statement after you've done a broad-based literature review. So you, you, you gather problematic areas and gap areas. Then you have to formulate the problem statement. Then from that problem statement, it will be easy for you to formulate a research topic. So that is the, the first way of coming with a tentative topic. I would like to discourage students who who go into publish articles and just pick research title from there and change one or two words. And then boom, they have their own research topic. That is a very bad practice. So it means that you are not working from a problem identification to a research. Okay. But you can see what other people are doing and, and, and see the problem that other people tackled in their, in their research. And also see whether those problems are common in your own context. And hence, you develop your problem statement along those lines. And then formulate your research topic. Because the way the, the, the problem is manifesting in one area can be different to that of other areas. So it's not good to just pick research titles in published articles and convert them to yours. That is a very bad practice. So after you formulated your problem statement, now you derive a research topic. Then now you use that topic. That will be a tentative research topic. You use that topic and write a proper research proposal. So now we are going to spend the rest of the, the, the lecture to see how we can write a proper research proposal. Okay. So let's look at um, the research proposal outline. So if you write a research proposal, I expect the following items to be included in your research proposal. Okay, this is not a, a one size fit all, but I've tried to capture the, some of the common things that should appear in your research proposal. Okay, so the first one will be the title page. Okay, the title page is where you have your names, your student numbers, if you've got one, the qualification being studied, and the names of your supervisor, the department or faculty, and the name of the institution, that is the university. So you may realize that this, um, this one is applicable to students who've registered to study in a faculty or a department. So you must have a title page. Even for funding application, you may also include a title page that will contain your name, the funding that you're applying for, okay? And or relevant information. Sometimes funding applications, they do have a template where you will use. So that is why I'm not uh, delving on, 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 on funding applications. So I want to focus on students who've registered 
in the department or a faculty. So you have a title page. Then you have your project title. So you can see that before you write your research proposal proper, you must have a title at hand. Hence, I've showed you how to get a, a provisional research title. So the, the, the previous slides were dedicated on how to, to get a, a, a tentative, a draft, or a provisional research title. So now, this is a research title that you must put on that title page. So it, 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 it means that you must have done some background work to come up with a research title, to position yourself, to come to get an idea on the, the, the problems that you want to tackle. So and, so, and then you derive your title. Then you use that title to write the proper research proposal. So now we are assuming that you've got a research title and now is the time to write a proper research project. Okay, so you must have a title page. You must include the project title on that title page. Then the document that you are producing must have a table of content, okay? And you must have an introduction, problem statement, literature review, the research rationale, the research objective, hypothesis, slash research question, the research methodology, data analysis, you must have a budget, a work plan, and a reference list, okay? So you can see in the introduction, you introduces various con concepts of the research. The problem statement is where you outline the problems that the research intend, the, 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 the problems that the research intends to resolve. Okay. Then you must have a, a literature review section where you review existing uh, publications and findings in the research niche area. Then you have the rationale, which is just the justification and all reasons for the research. Then there should be a dedicated section where you, you've outlined the research objectives and the research hypothesis or research questions. These are related to one another. So all these research objectives, research hypothesis, and research questions are things that are related to one another. If you know the research hypothesis, you can easily derive the research questions. And if you know the research objective, from there you can derive the research hypothesis and research questions. That's why I see they are related to one another. Okay. Then the research methodology is just a, 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 a pathway, okay, from the research design to sampling, then data collection. So how you are going to design the research and how you are going to do sampling and collect data is, is, and then analyze the data. So all of that is the research methodology. Okay. Then you should have a data, uh, data analysis section. This is where you are going to explain how the data that you've collected will be analyzed so that you can resolve what you said you are going to do in, in the objectives, you see, and or also resolve the hypothesis or answer the research question. So data analysis must be involved in the research. There is no research without data and there's no research without data analysis. Okay, so it's, it's very clear that you, you must have an understanding uh, of uh, of how data analysis is conducted before you can be able to 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 freeze your research objectives, research questions, or research hypothesis. It's very critical. There are many students who don't understand what data analysis is all about. It's very problematic. You must have an idea of the types of data analysis that are done in your discipline. It's very important. And how do you know it? You have to read many published articles in that research niche areas. Then you will see how other authors analyze their data. Okay. Then from there, you have an idea that if I'm doing such a research, 
then um, I'll obviously be doing these types of data analysis. So that's how it works. Okay, and of course you must have a budget, a work plan, and the reference list. The referencing is very critical. You must reference, you must cite all sources of information and reference them. Okay, so now let's look at the various segments of um, the research proposal document. So we have the introduction, which is very important. Okay. The introduction, I'll say, for a good research proposal should be maybe one to 1.5 page. I mean, if the introduction is longer than two pages, it becomes problematic. Okay, so what do we do in the introduction? In the introduction, you discuss various contexts about your research topic, okay? Just general information about the research topic, general things that are related to the research topic. Okay, so the introduction must be structured into individual paragraphs with each representing a central idea, a unique central idea, which I will call the paragraph themes. Okay, this is very important, themes. Okay, like I've said um, in my academic writing lectures, paragraphs should be built on themes, should be derived on a central theme, on, on a central idea. So if I read your document, your paragraphs should be unique. I should not be reading information, similar information in two different or two or more uh, different paragraphs, then it means that the structure of your paragraph is not good. Okay, so various contexts about the research topic should be discussed in teams. Then each paragraph should be built from a unique paragraph team. I've said that using the PIL approach. Okay, we are going to see more of the PIL approach. I've covered the PIL approach in my academic writing lecture, okay? You must listen to that lecture if you've not, if not done so. The PIL approach is a paragraph writing method. So it's an, it's an approach that defines how to structure a paragraph. Yes, I see a, a paragraph writing method. So if you follow that method to write a paragraph, then your paragraph will have the desired structure. Okay. There should be logical flow of information from the first paragraph team to the last one. So if you have your, your introduction, a one page introduction, you have different paragraphs. So each paragraph is carrying a central theme or a central idea. So, I mean, it's a, it's a narrative. All narrative must have a start point and an end point, okay? So when they say logical flow, it means there has to be some logic in the flow of information. So if, you, if you've written a story, you, you understand what I mean. Every story, it has a pattern. The story must start somewhere and must end somewhere. It's the same with writing, okay? So we can look at the paragraph themes as imaginary subheadings. This is very important because you have a title, okay, you have your research title, then now you must write an introduction that covers various contexts of that research title. So obviously the various section of the research title we produce themes because a research title will talk about what you are investigating. So you will definitely have themes that are coming from the various contexts of the research topic. So you, you must arrange those themes in, in, in a kind of a, a, a rough work 
or in, in a kind of a, a draft document. And then you populate and develop those things into paragraphs. So every writing must start with a structure, okay? Some people call it um, a mind map. You must have some kind of a mind map whereby you've outlined the themes that you are going to discuss under the topic. And then thereafter, you start to develop uh, the mind map further by populating the various arguments that you want to use within each central idea or within each paragraph theme. Okay, so the paragraph theme should be look, should be seen as a, a subheading, but you don't write it like we, 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 we write, we normally write a subheading. So you just view it as, a, as a, an imaginary subheading. Because if you do it that way, then you understand that the paragraphs should follow a particular flow of the, the information should flow within the paragraph in a particular manner. If you if you if you look at a, a, a document where you have headings, okay, surely you can't have uh, two headings that are similar. Then you you'll be having similar information in two different headings. That is not proper. Okay. So the same thing here, you can't seem to have two paragraphs that are containing similar information. So for most of my students, what I'm going to tell them is that you must merge the two paragraphs if they are having a similar type of information. Okay. The next one is the, the proposal itself. Okay, so we are looking at the introduction now of that proposal. So this is a kind of a, a mind map, if I can, if I can say so, a mind map of writing the, the introduction. Okay. So you have a title. From that title, you are going to look at, you are going to derive central ideas. Okay, so for an introduction of one page or 1.5 page, you should have at least six or seven central ideas that you want to cover in that introduction. So you need to, do your literature review and extract appropriate themes that you want to cover in that uh, introduction. So normally the first theme of your introduction is uh, which the first theme will produce the first paragraph is normally a general introduction and definition of important concepts. Okay, for those who have written introduction in an essay, you know that in your introduction, you are just clarifying concept, trying to discuss things to make them clear. Okay. So in your second paragraph, what you do is to discuss the first central idea, then the third central idea, then the fourth central idea, then the fifth. So depending on how many central ideas that you, you, you manage to pick, you lay them out. And then thereafter you develop each of those central idea using the peel approach into paragraphs. Okay. Then, then for a paper, for a research paper, the last paragraph, often um, the last paragraph often contains the thesis statement. Okay. So we are going to see more about the thesis statement, the thesis statement in the slide ahead.
Okay, so I say for a research proposal, an instruction may be between one to 1.5 page. In a 1.5 spacing, choice from A4 paper. So those people, those people who like to write three pages, four pages for the introduction, I don't think that is recommended. Okay, so let's look at the peel approach. Like I've said, I've covered a lot on the peel approach in my academic uh, academic writing lecture or, or the scientific writing lecture. So you need to look at that lecture. Okay, but I'm just going to revise it here again. Peel stands for point, evidence, explain, link. Okay. So this, like I said, the peel approach is used to structure a paragraph from a central idea. So this is the central idea that we have here on the far right. This is the central idea. Okay. From that central idea, I need to do a literature review on that central idea and get points to discuss the central idea. Okay. So the P, you must state the point. So now you state the point that you want to discuss in that central idea, okay? You state the point and then you explain it, okay? So you state the point and explain it. It doesn't mean that for every paragraph, there will be one point. No, it could be, you could have two, three, four, five, or more points that you want to discuss in that paragraph. So that you have to use an introductory sentence to state that point. Okay, so in a paragraph, the first sentence or the first two sentences or the first few sentences should be used to state the points, okay? So if you read any paragraph and look at the first few sentences, you will see that those sentences are used to state the point. And those sentences are called, if it is one, we say it is, you look for the topic sentence. But if there are many, it could be topic sentences, okay? So that introductory sentence that we normally see at the beginning of paragraph, where the points are stated, is called a topic sentence. <laughs> So, if you read the document of students who do not follow the appeal approach or who do not know how to write a paragraph, you will see that most often there's no sentence, to, there's, no, there's no topic sentence in, the, in, in their paragraphs. So the moment I see that, then I know that these students or this particular student does not know how to write a paragraph, period. If I don't find a topic sentence in a paragraph, then it means that you don't know how to write a paragraph. So after you've stated the point, you must explain it. Because sometimes if you state the point, it is explicit, explicit on its own. But sometimes you'll be required to just explain the point further for clarity. So that's why I say you state the point and explain it. Okay. Then the E, the E, you need, you need to provide evidence in support of the point because this, this discussion, this is academic discussion. You don't just state point, explain the point and then leave it like that. You must provide evidence to support the point. You must look for supporting point to support what, what you've stated to support the points that you've stated. Okay. And sometimes you also bring in examples. You provide evidence to support the point. You use example to support the point further. You see. So you know that we normally use example to support points. So examples, examples sometimes are evidence to support points. So they come together. So that's how you build a paragraph. Then the next E 
is to explain the evidence. You must explain the example and, and, and provide a narrative that is confirming that the, that evidence supports the point. You see, so you must explain. So you explain how that evidence supports the point. So sometimes you also use examples to further do, to further uh, uh, explain how the evidence supports the point. So you see, you have a lot of, you state the point, you must explain things. You don't just state the point, state points. Some students, they just state points, state points, state points, say this, say that, say this, say that. Then a paragraph is completed. Then they move to the next paragraph. They don't explain anything. They don't provide evidence. No supporting information to the points they've made. Okay, so P, you state the point. You provide evidence in support of the point. You explain how the evidence support the point. Then link is just kind of a, a conclude a summary that you make in support of the points. Okay, so that's what they call the linking, a kind of a conclusion. So we are linking the point in the paragraph. Sometimes you link the point in the paragraph and and preempt or and and and, and, and you. You link the current point. Sometimes you link when you draw a conclusion on the point. Then sometimes you you make you you make an intro of what will be will be discussed in the next paragraph. But this one is not always necessary. But it's an important technique that some people use. Okay. So now let's look at the hamburger. Paragraph analogy. The reason I'm using Hamburger, Hamburger is because almost everyone eats them. Okay. So if you look at the paragraph, you must think of a hamburger. It has got layers. Okay, and the first layer represents the topic sentence. Okay, so that's where you need to state the point and explain the points. So you, remember, it could be one point, it could be many points. So you, you might have two or more sentences. So we call them topic sentences or topic sentence. Okay, then that is the first sentence should be a topic sentence. So if I read a paragraph of a student, I don't find a topic sentence, then I know that student does not know how to write. Then you have the second sentence, which should be the supporting, uh, the evidence to support the point, okay? Or sometimes with examples used as evidence to support the point, and then, a further explanation on how that evidence supports the point and even the provision of further examples. Okay, and then you link the current point, you conclude on the current point, a kind of a summary, and then probably link it to the next point, make a link. That's why we are saying that there should be a logical flow of information. But if you read publications, then you understand this logic. So there's no way you can just listen to this lecture, read it, and then you know it. You have to be using it. Then with time, you are going to master the technique. But first, you must be aware of what it is all about. Okay, so that is that with the peel and the structure of a paragraph. So now let's look at um, after the introduction, you have the problem statement. Okay. The problem statement. The, the critical question that you ask is, what are the research problems? What are the problems that the research wants to tackle? You know, what are the problems that you want to resolve by doing this research? So we say important problems 
that the research seek to address must have the following characteristics. It must be socioeconomic in nature, okay? It must affect the social life or the economic life or both of humans. If, if, if the research is about the, the human society or animals, if the research is about the animal, the animal society, you know? So it must be beneficial to humans actually. Yeah, even those who are doing um, the, the space exploration, okay? From space exploration, we got satellites. So there must be a need or there must be some benefit of that research to, to, to the socioeconomic life of, of, of humans, okay? Even animals are useful to us. So if you are doing a research on animals, bacteria, all those things are done because it's going to serve us good. So that's why we do research. It must be socioeconomic in nature, and sometimes it negatively impacts the society. Okay. So most of the things that are affecting the society negatively, we tend to do research on them. So that's one characteristic of your problem statement. So there should be also pertinent knowledge gaps. Okay. So we must have knowledge gap must exist. So sometimes we don't know more. And if we don't know more about something, either we are wary that it's going to affect our social life, our economic life, it's going to negatively impact the society by the virtue of the fact that we don't know more about these things. Okay? Like we didn't know more about uh, coronavirus, how it's going to affect people with co mobility, uh, mobilities. Okay? So, uh, researches have to be done to understand how this virus is going to affect our life. So that is one of the you know, pertinent knowledge gap area. Okay, so you must understand the basis of a uh, problem statement. Some students, they just write things, just write and write and write without even understanding that this problem that I'm writing how is it affecting the, the society? Who is it affecting? And, and how, where, you know? So those are the things that we must pay attention when we write the problem statement. Okay, so like the introduction, the problem statement must also be structured into paragraphs, okay? And uh, the difference is that why we are discussing central ideas or paragraph themes in the introduction, under the problem statement, we are actually discussing problem themes. Okay, so like with the introduction, the first paragraph is the general information, you know, but with the problem, the first par paragraph is the introductory um, paragraph, okay? Or the introductory paragraph, or maybe topic sentence, if you want to see it that way. Where you need to state and introduce the various problem themes. Some students, when they write problem statement, they just write things, write things, write things, write things in random order. They just write a group of sentences, just just write sentences, write sentences. Yeah, this happened. Yeah, that, that other thing happened. Yeah, it was found that this happened. It was found that that happened. No, that is not how you write a problem statement. You write a problem statement by identifying problem themes. So if I identify four problem themes that are related to my research title, then I, I must expound each theme into a paragraph using the PIL approach. So the first uh, problem theme, the first sentence should be the topic sentence whereby I've introduced the problem. Because PIL is saying that you must take the point in a topic sentence. So that topic sentence will be 
the point will be the problem, stating the problem. Then, then you follow the P approach when you state the problem and explain the problem. Then you must provide evidence that that problem is actually existing. Then you can use example of the cause and consequences of that problem. So you explain it, the, you provide evidence of, to support that, 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 that problem that you stated is existing. Then you, you, you explain how the evidence is supporting the, the problem. You know, then you 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 link up, up. You know, link up could be a, a general statement, a take kind of a take home information. But in this case, one paragraph you cannot link one paragraph to the other. So it's better if you can discuss the problems in distinct paragraph. Okay. So problem team one, the first one is the introductory team whereby you state you outline all the problems. Then now I need to take, tackle the problem one after the other. So problem team one, I follow the peel approach, I state the points, I explain it, I provide evidence, I explain how the evidence supports the point. I go to problem team two, I do the same thing, problem team three. So, you, uh, so if somebody is ready, reading your problem statement in the introductory sentences or in the topic sentence, they should see how you've introduced all the problems and explain them briefly without going into details. Then you take each problem team, you state the point of the problem. Then you, 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 you explain it, then you provide evidence. And then you explain how the evidence explain the problem. So you don't just throw sentence, you don't just throw sentences randomly in the whole section because that's what most students do so when you read the problem statement it will be difficult for you to identify the various problem teams because they are just mentioning things here and there sometimes they even do a repetition without knowing okay so that's how you write a problem statement you must have problem teams sometimes some students don't do the introductory a sentence whereby they introduce all the teams. It's fine. So long as I have problem team one, problem team two, problem team three discussed in separate paragraphs, it's still fine. It's okay. Okay, so when you are, you are, uh, when you state the problem, you explain it, what the problem is. Then now you are just, you, not, you need to provide evidence that the problem is existing. Then you must explore all this. What is the problem? Why is it there? Where is the problem? Who is affected? And when was the problem? So you see, all these things must be used to to provide evidence of the problem and also to explain how the evidence relates to the problem, you know. So it's very important. Okay, so now, sometimes when we write a proposal, we do a literature review. But I just want to touch on the fact that a literature review is a process of searching for scholarly literature and extracting information. So you remember I said that even before you even get a topic, you need to search for scholarly literature and, and locate or and extract the, the research problem. Then you get a tentative title and use that tentative title to do a proper research proposal. Okay. Now, the purpose of a literature review is to educate oneself on the topic. I mean, when you do literature review on the, the, the research topic or the area of interest, you, you educate yourself on what others are doing, what are the gaps, the knowledge gaps, what are the problematics that you want to address in, a, in that particular niche area. So that is where you get all those information. It's very important to note that no one was born with all the knowledge in their head. So I, I see many students, they, they write problem 
statement from their head. They just write anything, sometimes no citation, no? We see stu students just formulate research objectives from their head. Or some of them, they just have this nice imagination of a catchy research topic. And they think that they can use that to write a research proposal. You can have a research topic from your imagination only to find out that you can't even formulate a problem statement out of it, let alone to search objectives. So it's, that's a very dangerous approach to, to getting a research topic. So now, we have the traditional literature review or the narrative. The, the traditional literature review or the narrative one is the one that is commonly used in research proposals, okay? Whereby you just derive topics that you want to cover and then you write narratives under each topic into paragraphs. So under each topic, you are going to have points that you want to discuss. So these are central ideas. You use, you use each central idea and develop a paragraph. So then you go back to the paragraph structure. So it's easy. The traditional or the narrative literature review is very easy, straightforward. Okay. Then you have the systemic review. So this one, systemic review, critical review, and meta analysis are the ones that we normally do in review papers. So this is another level of, of writing. But sometimes students can have a review paper inside the literature review. So you can have a section which is the general review. Then you have another section which is the systematic review, which you sent to one journal for, for publication, or it is a critical review, you see. So systematic review is the case where you are summarizing evidence in support of an argument. Okay, let's say you want to investigate um, why students uh, cheat in an exam, okay, or why food prices are skyrocketing, let's say in Cape Town. So you'll be looking for only the articles that have information about skyrocketing of food prices and analyzing the findings from those papers. So that will be a systematic review because you are looking for information to, to form a, a particular narrative, a particular argument. So you are systematic in the way you are you are sorting out the the, the, the published articles of interest. Okay. Then the next one is the critical review. A critical review is when you're doing an evaluation. So you have a research title or a review title that is in the form of evaluation. Okay. Then you'll be having a um, title that will say an assessment of this, 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 this a review or a critical review of a certain situation. So which means you'll be doing an evaluation. Evaluation means that you are going to gather facts, okay? Then you make a judgment at the end of the day. Okay, then the next one is meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is common in uh, social science, uh, I can see. This is whereby you go to individual research papers, look at the results and data, okay? Then collect result and data from many papers and, and, and formulate your own data, which you then later analyze them and then make a pronouncement. So you see, so it's like collecting uh, secondary data from publish articles. You know, most articles, they do have table of result whereby they have some data. So you may be interested only in a, in a subset of that data. So you take the data that was reported in that table of result, and you do the same for maybe 20 other papers, a similar kind of data from a similar population, a similar study population, and then you pull that data together, 
do and do your own analysis. That is called a meta-analysis. Okay, so it's pulling the results and data from related researches and analyze them. So it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting review. So you should maybe go to uh, some journals and try to, to look for articles that are derived from uh, meta-analysis. It's very interesting. Okay. So a narrative literature review is the one that you are going to use in your research proposal. So for still, you also have um, You also have uh, sections actually in that literature review. Sometimes you have an introduction. Sometimes people don't include an introduction in the literature review. In the introduction, you just define important concepts in terms of the topic. Okay. Then you have the body. Okay, that's where you dis you. You are going to cover various topics, various um, headings, or let me say various subheadings, because the heading will be literature review. So you have various subheadings. Like I said, the first one can be an introduction, of which uh, some people do not have that. Then you have a subheading one, subheading two, subheading three. Then you can also have other subheadings under the subheadings. So I uh, imagine this the literature review will be a heading level one, and then your introduction will be heading level two. Your subheading one will be heading level two. You can also have he heading level three under that subheading. Okay. So what am I saying here is that your literature review is good that you arrange them into subheadings. Okay. So you remember that in the introduction, we talk about imaginary subheadings. So but this one, in the literature review, we have actual subheadings, okay? So that is why if you read the introduction, you are not going to see headings there. So the, the, the central ideas or the paragraph themes takes over that position. Okay, so I mean, when you have a subheading, it becomes easy to look for points and discuss under that subheading. You understand? So each point should be developed into a paragraph. So it becomes a paragraph theme. So under each subheading, you should have different paragraph themes that are developed into paragraph using the peel approach. That's exactly what I'm saying here. Okay. Then sometimes at the end of your literature review, you can have a conclusion. Some people don't have it, it's still fine. Okay, the rationale, justification slash reason for the research. This is another section that most students struggled with. And it's very simple. Why are you doing this research? You must say it here, the relevance of your research. And we said that you, you do research to solve problems, knowledge gap, and your problems will be socioeconomic in nature, it must affect the society negatively. You see, and the knowledge gap must be very pertinent, you know? So this is the place to motivate so you need to explain how the research will contribute in solving all these problems. Under your rationale, or your justification of the research, or the reason for the research, explain how the research will contribute in solving the problems that you have outlined in the problem statement. Some people, when they discuss the rationale or the justification for their research, they, 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 they forget about their problem statement. They don't even link the two. 
the two should be linked. You should be explaining how your research will contribute in solving those problems that you've identified in your problem statement. You see, and furthermore, you must indicate the new knowledge that the research will bring, especially for a PhD. Because uh, one of the important um, assessment criteria for a PhD is that it must contribute new knowledge. New knowledge means something new to the body of, of, of knowledge in that research area or in that research niche. Niche. So ultimately you must justify why should money be spent on your research? Because when you do research, there's a budget. So it means somebody is going to spend money. The faculty is going to spend money. Okay, unless you are doing maybe in other disciplines whereby you don't need to spend money to do research, but in, in science, you, you, must, you must spend money to, to do research. Unless you are doing a desktop study, which is a literature review, unless you are doing one of the literature review that we've indicated, either you are doing a narrative, but most often, Journals do not publish narrative literature review. So critical analysis or a meta-analysis literature review, those are the ones that are often published by many journals. So if you are doing a literature review, okay, it's still a research, but we are talking about uh, research. Uh, we are talking about researches that are done through experiment or via a survey. So if you are doing a survey study, surely there should be some money spent. And if you are doing an experiment, surely there should be some money spent. Okay, so ultimately you need to justify why money should be spent on your research, how pertinent the research is. And all of that should be in your explanation on how the research will contribute to solving the problems that you've aligned in your problem statement. It's very clear. So I don't know why some students uh, get it wrong. Some students will just write all kinds of things. Many of them will not be related to their problem statement. Okay, so now it's time for us to look at the research objective, which is the, another part of important part, another important part of the research proposal. Okay. So now, there's a link between these things. You have your title, you have your introduction, which should, uh, should cover different um, aspect of the title. Then you have your problem statement, which should outline the problems that the research intends to resolve. Then you have your literature review. We should cover, should cover different aspects of the various aspects of the of, of the research, various concepts of the research. Okay. So the literature review is vast. You can include many things. Okay. So it's not very stringent like the introduction. For the introduction, you need to limit yourself to the to the research niche area. And you should be guided by the title. All the concepts that are embodied in the title should be, should, should be covered in the introduction. Okay, now let's look at the research objective. You design your research objectives looking at your problem statements. This is another aspect where you find students having a problem statement but when they state their research objectives, you find out that these research objectives are not related to the problem statement. They are not emanating from the problem statement. So you see that the two are not linked. So it means you are saying that I have identified this problem, but by the time you want to state your research objectives, you are doing another research. So it's very problematic, okay? 
design research objectives from the problem statement. So if you identify problem, you must design objectives that are designed to solve that problem. It is as simple as that. Okay, so now we move to the next one, the next point. Independent and dependent variables. My God, you find PhD students, master students, postgraduate students, many of them do not know the difference between independent variables and dependent variables. Yes, many of them do not know the difference. So when you design a research objective, especially for those who are doing experiment or survey, you should have a dependent and independent variable in that research objective. So that's why I'm saying independent and dependent variables involved in the study or in the research should be identified. So the moment that you, you are designing a research objective from the problems that you've stated, you must immediately identify dependent and independent variable in that objective. So if you state your objectives, especially those who are doing survey and experiment, if you state your objectives and you don't know the dependent and independent variable in that objective, then it's like the blind leading the blind. It means you are blind and you are trying to lead the blind also. Okay, so anyone who is listening to this lecture, please, you must know the differences between independent and dependent variable. And you must know how to identify these variables in an in a research objective. So when you state a research objective, you should be able to pinpoint exactly that this one is my independent variable and this one is my dependent variable. Please. So you need to work hard to figure out this. Okay. So if you figured out your dependent and independent variable, then you must know the phenomenon under investigation. Okay, what am I investigating? It should be a variable that you're investigating, but the variable should, has, uh, should have a name. And also the variable should have, there must be a phenomenon, a kind of a relationship that you are looking at. That phenomenon that I'm talking about is the relationship that is at play involving the two variables, the dependent and independent variables. So if you, 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 you state your research objective, then you'll be investigating something, something that is related to the dependent and independent variable. That's what I'm saying. The phenomenon under investigation should be identified. So there's something that you are investigating, something that has prompted you to conduct an investigation. So there should be a phenomenon. So, the independent variable, the dependent variable, and the phenomenon that you are investigating. Okay, so by the time you've sorted out your, your research objective, now it's time to, to, to do the hypothesis, especially for those who are doing experiment, especially for those who are doing survey. It's very critical for you to have a research hypothesis. Okay. Because the research hypothesis will help you to know where you are heading to. So now let's see what is a research hypothesis. A research hypothesis is a statement that predicts the outcome of the phenomenon being researched. You see? So if you are investigating something, then you are expecting to get a result. So if you are investigating a phenomenon by conducting a survey, or by conducting an experiment, you expect to get an outcome. And by reading research articles and, and by understanding the, the, that phenomenon, it's able for you to predict what the outcome will be. But we are going to see more of this in the slides ahead.
Okay, so sometimes we need to do a statistic analysis to conclude on that outcome. So that is why I'm saying that a statistic and model to test this outcome must be identified in advance. So here we are. So you remember I said that when you are formulating research objectives, you must have an idea on the types of data analysis that are done in that discipline. So it's very important that when you, you are doing a literature review, you must understand the kind of uh, data analysis uh, that are done in the type of research that we are busy with. Okay, because you need that information when you are formulating your research objective. So when you have that information, then it will be easy for you to formulate your hypothesis. Some students just form, form hypothesis out of their imagination. They just imagine things and form hypothesis. No, a hypothesis is something that we formulate with the knowledge on the type of data analysis that we are going to do to achieve that to resolve that uh, hypothesis. Then for the such question, I mean, you can ask a question about uh, the, the expected outcome. So you are just putting it in a question format. Sometimes you can take your hypothesis and convert it into a question format. Or you can take your research objective and question what you expect to find you know, and put it in a question format, pointing to what you expect to, to have as an answer after the research. That's what a research question is just all about. So why for a hypothesis, you are predicting the outcome of that phenomenon? For the research question, you're asking a question that will give you an answer relating to that phenomenon. Okay, but we are going to see examples. But these are things that if you don't know them, you must know them before you start to write a research proposal. You can't write a research proposal without knowing the differences between dependent and independent variable. You can't write a research proposal without having an idea on the type of data analysis that are done in the type of research that you are doing. And you can't formulate a hypothesis without knowing the type of statistical analysis that will be used to resolve such a hypothesis. So that I see students formulate hypothesis without knowing anything about data analysis. So they don't read, when they read the paper, they don't, they go to data analysis, they just jump it. You can't skip it. You must understand the type of data analysis that are common with the kind of research that you are doing. I'm repeating that again. Okay, so now, this is another problem. I've said you must know dependent and independent variable. Okay. Okay, now, so research variables and scales. Okay. The variables are attribute or characteristics of an object being researched. So remember, I'm saying you are researching a phenomenon, okay? You are researching something and you need to measure a few things, especially for those who are doing a survey or conducting an experiment. So you end up having variables that you need to measure, okay? So we call them research variables. So when you formulate a, a research objective, you should have dependent independent variables and you should be able to measure them. You measure their relationship. You measure a phenomenon that concerns the two. But now you need to collect data to be able to, to analyze the data and make a pronouncement on that phenomenon that we are investigating. Okay, so now we have two types of uh, research variables. So two types of research variables will automatically translate with the type of data will automatically translate to the type of scales. So by the time we are capturing the data into an Excel spreadsheet or SPSS spreadsheet or any anal data analytical 
a, a platform, we automatically need to know the type of data that we are dealing with. So we have the qualitative data and the quantitative data. Okay. The qualitative data is common in, in, in surveys, okay, whereby you, 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 you take the gender, the race, the eye color, the plot types of a respondent. When, when you do that, it becomes a qualitative data. So when you're taking your gender, their race, that type of qualitative data is called the nominal data. So for qualitative, we have two types, the nominal and the ordinal. Okay. Ordinal, I mean from the word order. So it means there's, there's an order on how the, 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 the scale is laid out, how you lay out the scale. There's an order. So a good example would be the Likert scale. Another example would be the income bracket. Okay, remember I'm using income bracket. I'm not using income. Because if you use income, if you are collecting the income of people, then you, you have a discrete number. Okay, so that is no more an ordinary scale. But if it is an income bracket, then it automatically becomes an ordinary scale because income bracket will be in, maybe in increasing quantity, okay? So all the brackets, age bracket, rating scales, like distinction, no distinction, it becomes ordinary, okay? Like uh, in those, in those uh, uh, courses where you have A grade, B grade, C grade, D grade. So imagine that I'm checking the grade of students in, in, in a course. So if I'm going by A, B, you know that that A grid has a bracket, maybe I think it's 80 to 100 or 75 to 100. So wherever you have those bracket scale, whereby there's increasing order of quantity, it becomes an ordinary scale. But if you have a scale that is named, but there's no increasing order of quantity, like gender, male and female, there's no increasing order from male to female or female to male. So it's just, that those are just names. So hence nomina. The same thing with race. There's no increasing order of magnitude from one race to an, a, another. But for the scale, the Likert scale, there's an increasing order of magnitude. I like, do not like, like, like very much. So there's an increasing order of magnitude. So I hope now you know the difference between the nominal scale and the ordinal scale, okay? We can also say nominal data and ordinal data. So the scale is what you use to collect the data, okay? So the scale, if it's an ordinal scale, you get an ordinal data. If it's a nominal scale, you get a nominal data. So when we hear people talking about nominal data, nominal scale, don't get confused. So these two are qualitative. Okay, now let's go to quantitative. Quantitative now is, is about measurements. Okay, discrete measurements. You understand? Not necessarily discrete measurements. We have continuous measurement and discrete measurement. All of them are measurements. Then you see the difference. Okay. Discrete measurements, continuous measurements, all of them are numbers, by the way. Let me see they are numbers, okay? They are just numbers. So when you are collecting data, you collect a certain numbers. But now there's, a dis there's discrete and continuous. Discrete are those numbers that are definite, okay? It's not endless. It's definite. You must get a definite number. If I ask you that, how many siblings are there in your family? You must have a number. It can be continuous. So if I go to, to a population, I'm checking the number of children per household. I'll get discrete numbers. 
in that population, it, it has to be discreet. Or how many students are there in a school? So if I'm counting all the schools in, 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 in South Africa, I must have a, 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 a discrete number, I must have a definite number, okay? If I'm counting the number of lecture, lecturers in a university or in a faculty, I must have a definite number. So we call them discrete data or yeah, discrete data. So that's one form of a quantitative data. Then we have the continuous. So if I go to a population to measure weight, the weight is not going to be definite. So it, 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 I'll have a continuous data. You see, so it can range, weight can range from anything from 50 to the highest person. You see, but it's not going to be like, I'll get a weight of 60, I'll get a weight of 50, I'll get a weight of 25. No, you get point, you get fractions. So hence continues. But if I'm measuring number of children per family, I can't get decimals. Let me just use the word decimals. So you see that, I think the difference there will be the decimals. Okay, I can have decimals, but for discrete, you can't have decimals. So it must be a, a, a distinct whole numbers. I must have distinct whole numbers. So that shows the difference. So you have the numbers and then you have the, the, the nominal and ordinal. The nominal and ordinal can also be in numbers, but those numbers are representing something they are not numbers that are coming out of a measurement so hence qualitative data are not data that are coming out of a measurement okay even if you have numbers there like one can be male two can be female so it's just arbitrary okay for race one can be black the other one can be white the other one can be indian it's just, you just attribute those numbers just for the for, for data handling purpose. The same with Likert scale. Sometimes you have the, the nine point Likert scale, the six point Likert scale, ranging from one to nine. Those are just attributions. But with quantitative, they are actually measurements or counts. Okay, so and for continuous you have decimals. So sometimes when I have an ordinary data, I know that there are certain statistic analysis that I cannot do. Okay, for instance, I can calculate the standard deviation when I'm dealing with ordinary data or nominal data. You can calculate mean and standard deviation. But when I'm dealing with quantitative data, I can do mean and standard deviation. So you, you start to see that the type of data we already, the type of data we tell you, the type of data analysis that you can do and that you cannot do. So it's very good to understand your data. Okay. So the famous or the infamous independent and dependent variable. When you are dealing with um, experiments, okay, this particular um, sketch is for mostly for experiments. So you can see uh, experiments. So those people who are doing experiments in the lab or in the field, you know what an experiment is. We are going to see it in the slide ahead. When you are conducting an experiment, there's some variables that you set up, okay? Then you run the experiment, then, then you measure some other variables. So this is one way that you can identify your independent variable. So if I'm setting up an experiment, for instance, I want to see the number of eggs that my, my chicken 
we lay per day. Then I must put maybe five hand in one pen and put six hand in other pen. Then I want to check how many hand, uh, what amount of egg I'm going to get at the end of the day. So you see that I'm going to count amount of egg at the end of the day. So the, the number of chicken that I'll put, I'll obviously count them. So before I start my experiment, I have my chicken and I've counted my chicken. So the number of chicken will automatically be my independent variable because I counted the chicken before I even start the experiment. So when I put the chicken and maybe feed the chickens uh, differently, then I count the, the number of egg at the end of the day. So at this end, what I'm measuring at this end of the experiment. So this is the end of the experiment. I call it output. Okay, the output is like the effect after I've run, I've run my experiment. So all those variables that you are measuring during while you are running the experiment, you are measuring at intervals or you measure it at the end of the experiment. Those variables are the dependent variables. So we see output variables measured only during or after the experiment. So during would be the one that you are measuring at intervals, at different intervals or at different duration. Or some experiment, you only measure things after the experiment, the experiment is done. Okay, so all those variables that you are measuring during the experiment or at the end of the experiment, those are your dependent variables. Okay, for those who are doing the experiment. So when you formulate your research objectives, you must ask yourself that, what am I investigating? So most, most of the time, the, 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 when you're investigating something, it means you must, you, you have, the, the, there's a variable that you are going to, you're going to collect data for during the experiment or after the experiment. So if you can identify that variable that you're going to collect data for at intervals during the experiment or at the end of the experiment, that particular variable will be your dependent variable. So all the other variables that you, you, you put together, for instance, okay, if I want to, 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 to see the effect of, of mixing acid and base. So I'll measure a certain amount of acid and measure a certain amount of base. Then the, the two will react. They will produce something that I'm going to measure. You understand? So all the measurements that I, I, I have at hand before I start my experiment, all those measurements are independent variable. The thing that I'm going to measure after I've run the experiment would automatically be my dependent variable. Okay, hence I said input variables and output variables. Okay, that is for experiment. Now let's see how it works for people who are doing survey research, especially maybe you're doing sensory evaluation for those who are doing food sciences. Okay, or you are doing any questionnaire-based research. So I just generally call them uh, a survey research. So if you are doing a survey research, your independent variables are mostly the social demographic attributes of your respondents. Okay, because these things are already there. So when you meet any population, the, the attribute of that population is there, okay? So just like with the case of an experiment, these are the things that you, you have it, you have there. You just note, you note the gender, you note their income, you note their qualification, you note their training. Or if you are doing a survey on an object, because we don't only do survey on humans, you can be surveying trees, you can be surveying cars passing by the roadside, you can be surveying anything. You can be surveying fruit, sizes, you know. So there are things that are already, there are attributes that are already there. Either it's a ripe fruit or it's a big fruit, you know. 
or is a primary school. So those attributes are already there. So we call them the social demographics. Okay. So those are the demographic attributes. Those are independent variable. So your yeah, dependent variable for a survey will be what? It should be the variables in the questions or actually the questions or the checklist. Okay, the questions that you pose or the checklist that you are using to assess the, 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 the objects that are being researched. Maybe you are checking the quality of food. Okay. Obviously, you must have the type of fruit, where it's being sold, who is selling the fruit. All those attributes are social demographic attributes. Then now you say clean, not clean. Okay. Those are the questions. Is the fruit clean? Is the fruit properly packaged? Is the fruit this? All those questions that are asking automatically becomes your dependent variable. Because depending on the answer you are going to get, then that, that, that becomes your output variable. So for those who are doing research, it's very direct. You don't need to, to, to get confused. Okay, unless you are doing an experiment, unless you are doing the, 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 the quasi-experiment, experiment, the quasi-experiment design. But if you are doing a simple survey, then this is how to identify your dependent and independent variables. Okay, so now we need to delve into the research objective. Okay, let's see a few examples. Like I said, that there's something that you want to do in your research. So you have the green words. The green words will be to evaluate, to investigate, to evaluate, to assess. All those uh, action words must be in your objectives. If you have a research objective without the action words, it will become very difficult for someone to tell what is it that you want to do. Okay, so let's look at uh, objective one, to evaluate the bactericidal potential. Okay, bactericidal potential is killing bacteria, the ability to kill bacteria. So if we're analyzing killing bacteria means we'll, we'll count how many bacteria are dead, you know, something like that, how many are living. That is the way you can know the bactericidal potential. That's the way to know whether a chemical is killing something is to count the dead ones or the, those that will not leave, you know. So to evaluate the bactericidal potential of different variables T S top. So how do I identify my dependent and independent variable? Okay. So you see, what am I evaluating the bactericidal potential? So it means I'm going to collect data on the bactericidal potential. Yes. And I'm going to collect data on the bacteria potential after my experiment. Because that's what I'm evaluating. So what am I going to take into the experiment? I'm going to take ribose extracts into the experiment. Therefore, I will surely take ribose extract and bacteria and mix them together. Then I'll see how the bacteria will die. Then I'm going to measure bacteria death. You see, so my dependent variable will become the, the bactericidal potential. So bacterial death in actual fact. So I know that my dependent variable will be bactericidal potential. So what data am I going to collect there? The data I'm going to collect there is I'm going to count live bacteria or dead bacteria. You see, therefore ribose T um, ribose tea extracts, definitely I'll have different extracts, maybe different quantities or, or stuff like that, but my independent variable will definitely be ribose tea extract. Therefore, I'm going to prepare different ribose tea extracts, maybe different amount, maybe using different extraction solvents and stuff like that. So this is how I, I get to know my independent variable. I will do my experiment with ribose tea. Therefore, 
variable C extract is my independent variable. At the end of the day, I'm going to measure bacteriocidal potential. Therefore, bacteriocidal potential is my dependent variable. Let's see the, the next one. So what are we investigating? We are investigating the proximate composition of wild watermelon juice extract. So you know this, uh, we have the, the, the sweet watermelon that we, we buy from the shops, but there are also some watermelon that are in the wild. Okay, so what to investigate the proximate composition. So what am I going to do? Means I have to get watermelon juice extract and take them somewhere and perform experiment to get the proximate composition. So the proximate composition is what I'm going to measure after the experiment or during the experiment. So it automatically becomes my dependent variable. Okay. And the Y watermelon juice extract will automatically be my independent variable. Okay. Next example, to evaluate the food safety knowledge of food vendors in Johannesburg. Okay, this one is a survey question because you are, you are, I'm going to investigate the uh, food safety knowledge of food vendors in Johannesburg. So these are humans, food vendors are human beings. Food safety knowledge are definitely, is definitely a survey study. Okay. We, we said that for a survey study, the social demographics will be the, 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 the independent variable. And then the questions will be the dependent variable. So all the social demographics of the food vendors in Johannesburg will automatically be my independent variable. Then food safety knowledge. I'm going to, to measure the food safety knowledge of these people. So how do you measure the, somebody's knowledge? You give them a quiz. So it means I'm going to ask them questions. So all the, 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 the variables that I'm going to be testing will be in the questions that I'll be asking them. So the, the food safety knowledge that I'm going to test becomes my dependent variable because at the end of the day, I'll test their knowledge by seeing, by calculating or by evaluating how much knowledge they have by checking their scores. You understand? So it's like in an exam, they give you an exam, you get your score. Your score will determine your knowledge of that subject. It's as simple as that. Then uh, number four, to assess consumer acceptance of modified green tea extracts. This one is also a survey. When you do a sensory evaluation or a consumer acceptance uh, so, uh, survey, it's a, it's a kind of a sensory evaluation. So what am I investigating? What am I assessing? I'm assessing consumer acceptance. So it means I must go into my survey with green tea extra that I've prepared. So it automatically becomes my independent variable. After I, you give uh, the people the, the extra to taste, then they are going to, to mark their, how much they like each of the extra. Then at the end of the day, I'll take that data to calculate my consumer acceptance. So therefore consumer acceptance is something that I'm going to calculate at the end of my survey or my experiment. So it automatically becomes the dependent variable. Okay, so let's see the last one. The last one is not very direct in the sense that it doesn't start with to evaluate, to investigate, to assess, because some people, we think that that's how everything will look like, you know? We don't follow pattern here. If you are following pattern, then you run into trouble. So let's read the, the fit one and try to work out what we are going to, which variable are we going to collect data at the end of the experiment? And which variable are we taking into the experiment to be able to determine our dependent and independent variable? That is the only way. There's no, don't, don't try to follow my pattern to say, oh, to accept, to evaluate, then therefore that one becomes the independent. No, it doesn't work like that. You must interrogate which one am I taking into the experiment? Which one am I going to measure during or after the experiment? Okay. Investigate, investigate the objective is investigate the effect of salt quantity 
on the volume of banana loaf. So uh, this is a banana loaf bread. Eh? Yeah, it's a, it's a bread. So I want to investigate the effect of salt quantity. So clearly, to start this experiment, I must have salt quantity. Means I must have different quantities of salt. Okay, and then uh, I'm going to prepare a banana loaf and mix it. You see. Then I when, when I bake, after baking, I'll measure the volume of the banana loaf. So automatically, salt quantity will be my independent variable. So that is the variable that I'm going to take into the experiment. And banana, the, the volume of banana loaf will become my dependent variable because that is the variable that I'm going to measure after the experiment. So you see, it doesn't mean that the dependent variable always comes first and the independent variable come second. So that's why I'm warning you not to get a false pattern. Okay. Now, we look at hypothesis. Okay. We said hypothesis is to make a statement that is, that is making an affirmation on the anticipated outcome of the relationship that we are being investigating. For instance, if we are invest investigating a cause-effect relationship, an example would be salt quantities and volume of loaf. So salt quantity is directly affecting the, the volume of uh, banana loaf bread, you see. So, a cause-effect relationship is the one whereby the independent variable is directly causing an effect on the output variable. So an example that I've given you is the salt, which is the independent variable, affecting the volume of banana loaf, which is the dependent variable. So sometimes when you state hypothesis, you should know whether the variable the independent variable and the dependent variable are having a kind of a cause-effect relationship. Okay, so if it's a cause-effect relationship, then you have this scenario. So the dependent variable of something subjected to the independent variable will have an anticipated outcome. Okay. So we want to see how the dependent variable behaves when subjected to the independent variable. What is the outcome? Okay, so I'll read the first one. The rheology and viscosity of soup. Okay, this is it. The yeah, rheology of soup subjected to temperature. So what are we having now? So if I have the rheology of soup subjected to temperature. So the independent variables, normally we, we divide them into groups or factors. Okay, so you see that you should actually have different temperatures. Okay. So when you do this kind of research, you have the, 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 the variable that you are taking into the research. Normally we have, we normally have them into groups because when you do an experiment, you want to see how different groups are behaving. So in actual fact, in a cost effect relationship, we normally split the independent variable into groups. So into groups or factors like temperature, we might have 70, 60, 50, so we call them uh, factors, different levels of the independent variable, okay? Or if it is formulation, then we have different formulation of, a, of the soup, which means you have a soup whereby the ingredients have different quantities, a set of ingredients with different quantities, so we, have, we call them formul formulations. 
So we want to see how the rheology of different formulation will behave. So that, that is the cost effect relationship. Things that the independent variable, the temperature will directly affect the rheology of, of the soup. Different formulation will affect the rheology or the sensory property of the soup. You see. So if we look at three, which is the food safety knowledge, the social biographic of the people. So people with different social biography might have different food safety knowledge. But this one is not a cost effect relationship. This one, this number three, is not a cost effect relationship. Maybe if 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 we say uh, people social biography as in training that they were trained, because if you are training a group of people, then it becomes an experiment. You train them and then you check their knowledge. That is an experiment. So you find out that those who receive training who have food safety knowledge. So we can say training can affect, food safety training can affect the food safety knowledge. So in that scenario, there will be a cost effect relationship. But if you are just checking their biography and no training, then it, it can be a cost effect relationship. I hope that is clear. So yeah, we should have training. It must be an experiment actually. Cost effect relationship works in an experiment. Okay, so if, if it's not an experiment, if you are doing a survey, then don't don't expect a cost effect relationship. I'm going to explain why in the next slide. Because in a survey, the system is already stagnant. You are not subjecting any system to an experiment to, to measure an effect. So therefore you can't have a cost effect relationship in a, in a survey study, only in, in a study that is an experiment whereby you have groups because the independent variable is always put into groups. So for this one, if we say social biography, then it should be a group of people whereby one group was trained and the other group was not trained. So then that becomes a quasi experimental design. Okay. So it is still an experiment. So cause effect relationship works only for experimental designs where you are doing, an, you are actually doing an experiment. So like I said, that in a system whereby you, you are not subjecting uh, 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 the, the, the research object to an experiment, then you definitely be doing a survey. You see. So you see this one, the average mark, the BMI of food safety knowledge. So take number one, the average mark and taking of extra classes of students are significantly correlated. So you see, this is an association. So we are predicting prediction and association. You can only predict that people who are taking extra class will get high average mark. We can only predict, okay? So we are looking for association. So if it's not a cause effect relationship, then you are betting on a prediction or an association. So we can predict that taking extra class can in increase your average mark. So prediction and association, if you use the word predict, then the type of data analysis that you're going to use becomes a regression. But if you use association, then you can use correlation or chi-square. So it just depends on what you're looking for in your research objective. So this is an example to show you that we, we, we don't just formulate a research objective as haphazardly. You have to be very careful on your choice of dependent and independent variable and what do you want to do? If, if you want to conduct an experiment, then you are, you are, you are going in for a cause effect relationship. And then it's going to affect the type of data analysis that you are, you are going to do. But if you are just going to survey the system, you are not subjecting the system to an experiment, then you, you can only look at prediction or association. So therefore, that is why some people in their, in their research objective, they are saying that they are going to look for prediction or association. Then when they come to data analysis, they'll tell you that they want to do ANOVA. You can do uh, ANOVA 
Of course, there's a non-parametric ANOVA, but you can do the, the, the ANOVA whereby you use mean and, and, and standard deviation, you see. But in this case, if you are doing an experiment whereby you have groups, then ANOVA, this is a T test or ANOVA. So those are some of the things that you need to understand when you are formulating your research objective. You must ask yourself, am I formulating an objective that involves variables with cost effect relationship? If yes, then it means you are your independent variable must have groups, and then you must do a NOVA kind of analysis. If not, and then it means you are just doing a snapshot of the system. You are not subjecting your independent variables into groups and running an experiment. Then you can only do prediction or association. Then you end up with chi-square or non-parametric ANOVA. Okay. So let's look at uh, the research question. The research question is an inquisitive inquisitive question, question, sorry, based on anticipated outcome. So you are questioning the anticipated outcome basically, okay? So, it, and it has to do with the, 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 it has to be the outcome of the relationship between the dependent and independent variable. You remember I'm saying you are, the, the phenomenon, there's a phenomenon that you are, you are investigating, okay? so. The phenomenon is usually embedded in the dependent variable. You see, so let me just use this one. What will be the rheology of soup subjected to different temperature? So remember, I told you that the independent variable must have groups. So this one is 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 is, is a, a research question to a cause effect a relationship between. Uh, variable. So it's a good example of a research question that relates to cost effect system or a cost effect relationship between dependent and independent variable. So this is a typical research question. So you are probing the dependent the, the phenomenon related to the dependent variable. So in this case the rheology. Okay, we are probing the rheology, which is if you are investigating the rheology, so what would be the rheology? So you are asking the question on the, in, the dependent variable. That, that phenomenon is that you are investigating is, is tied to the dependent variable in cause effect relationships. Okay. Okay, so now you can see that, yeah, I'm just trying to demonstrate how research objectives, research hypothesis and research questions can be related, okay? So, so, like we are seeing here that we want to evaluate the bactericidal potential of different ribose okay? What are we investigating? Bactericidal potential automatically becomes our dependent variable. Then now see how I can transform that to, to the hypothesis. So what am I investigating the bactericidal potential? Then I can say the bactericidal, remember that this is an experiment. So the independent variable must have groups. So I'll say the bactericidal potential of different ribose T extracts will be significantly different. So now this group is transformed into different ribose T extracts will be significantly different, you see. So this is the outcome. The outcome that I'm, 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 I'm stating is significant difference between the bacteriocidal potential of different ribose T extract. So it means that it's telling me that my data analysis will be analyzing the bacteriocidal potential of different ribose T extract. So I can have five extract, then I'll be comparing. So that five extract becomes different, becomes five groups. So I must have groups. See, this is a cause-effect relationship as well, because the ribose T will be directly killing the bacteria. So it's a cause-effect relationship. So which means my independent variable, which is the ribose T, must be in groups. Let's look at this one to investigate the proximal composition of Y metamelon juice extract. The same thing. 
proximate composition being analyzed. So I'm saying the proximate composition of wild watermelon juice extracts will be significantly different. So I'm saying the different extract will have significantly different proximate composition. So this sentence can be put in different ways. So don't think that for those who know how to rephrase a sentence in many different ways, I can say that um, I can start by saying different extract of why watermelon juice will have significantly the same or significantly different proximate composition. So you see, I've put it in another way, but the information must be the same. Okay? It doesn't mean that you can put it in another way. The way I've designed it here is just to show you the pattern. Like, okay, this one is a survey to evaluate the full safety knowledge of street food vendors. Then I can make my hypothesis to say the full safety knowledge of street food vendors will vary. So we are, we are seeing that the, the different groups here will be vendors of different social demographic. For instance, male, male, female, or race. If I take race, then I'll have three groups. Then in that way, I'll be able to, to, to measure the, the, the food safety knowledge in a scale of maybe poor, average, better. So you see, then I can ask the question, what is the food safety knowledge of street food vendors? You can put, bring in the different social demographics there. Because that's what we are we are looking. Okay, to assess consumer acceptance of modified green tea extract, the consumer the consumer acceptance of modified green tea extract will be very high. This one is not very good because if we say modif this is not a good uh, hypothesis, we expect to get different. So it should be significantly different or, or significantly the same year, not very high. Because what do we expect? We have different groups of extra. So we want to check consumer acceptance. We are comparing the different group of extra. So it's either it's significantly the same or significantly different. So this one is wrong. To investigate the effect of salt in the volume of banana loaf, okay. What are we saying? We have we have different banana loaf. So we are saying the volume of banana loaf will decrease with higher amount of salt. This one is also good. So we have different banana loaf. We are saying that the volume will decrease. So with higher amount of salt. So it means if we do a regression, it should show us a decrease. Or if we do, yeah, a, a regression line should show us a negative, a negative gradient. So that will be the statistical test for this one. So it, can, it will be significantly, the negative gradient will be significant. So we'll do the negative gradient, we we'll see that there's a minus, then the gradient has to be significant. So that is the way to test this one. Okay. Now, research methodology and research design. These two is confusing, but I don't know. Many students get confused between research methodology and research design. When you ask them to talk about research design, they talk about research methodology and vice versa. Okay. A methodology is the overall thing. The scientific and logical approach to collect and analyze data is the overall. The research design in itself talks to the experiment, if I can put it that way. It talks to the type of experiment that you want to do. And they say research design. So for those who are doing survey studies, when you're explaining your research design, you must talk about that it will be a survey study in which blah, 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 blah. Or if it's, if it's an experiment, you see the research design will be an experiment. 
in which blah, 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 blah. Or it, it will be a semi-experiment or a, a quasi-experimental design. So you talk about the type of experiment or the, the type of survey. Okay. So let's look at the different type of experimental design. So I'm saying is the type of experiment. I mean, the research design is a type of experiment. So the research, when you're talking about your research design, you must talk about the experimental design. So that's it. Because in most research paper, people write the research design, but sometimes you can put the experimental design because when you're talking about the research design, you must talk about the experimental design. So they're, 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 they are together. Okay. So when you're talking about your research design, you must say either it's a pre-experimental design, a quasi-experimental design, or it's a true experimental design. So these are the different types of experimental design. A pre-experimental design is a research design in which a subject or group of subject are subjected to treatment and then observed. So you just have one group of sample. Okay? Then you observe them. So it's a pre-experimental design. Then a, a quasi experimental design is to investigate a, a, a causal impact of an intervention. So these are intervention studies, like in social science or those people are dealing with animals. So you want to see the effect of vaccination against a particular disease, you see. So you are looking at intervention, intervention kind of a research on a target population. So what you normally do, you group the population, one population with intervention and the other population without intervention. The moment you are you, are, you do that, you know that you are doing a quasi quasi experimental design. Okay, grouping a population, maybe animals or human. Then you do intervention in one group and not the other group and observe the response. They do quasi-experimental design in maybe drug testing, where in one group they give them a placebo. A placebo is the tablet without the active ingredient. Then they give the other one the tablet with the active ingredient. So that is also a quasi-experimental design. True experimental design is the one that has a, a control group in which a variable is tested, okay? So you have the experimental group, and then you have the control group. Okay, and then you, then you, you do your experiment and analyze all of them. So for experimental design, experimental design is a little bit complex because somebody can say, okay, for quasi, there's a group that Cause is an intervention, just know that. But for experimental, we normally have the control. Normally we, we do have positive and negative controls. So those who are doing science know about it. I can't overemphasize on that. You have the positive control, you have the negative control sometimes. So, so the, for the positive control, you, you already know that it's going to produce the expected result in the findings. Then for a negative control, you know that it's not going to produce so you are just trying to, to make sure that your finding is not a, a kind of a random occurrence. That's why you have positive and negative control. So for those who are doing experiments, these are the three principles that you must have. You must have replication. So all those who are doing experiments, all those who are doing experiments in the lab, you are doing experiments in the field, you are doing experiments using instruments, you must have replicates, okay? Replicate means you must do it more than once in different times. So for instance, if I'm analyzing, if I grow my bacteria and extract protein from them, and then I measure the protein, I must grow my bacteria under a specific under a, a set of conditions and then extract protein from the bacteria and measure the amount of protein. 
Replication means I must come again in another time, grow another the same bacteria in the same set of conditions during another period and do the same thing and measure. And then I'll have those two results and, and get their mean and get their standard deviation. That's why when you look at many tables, you have mean and standard deviation. And they will tell you that they do three, 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 three replicates or two replicates. Okay. So that is the way the, uh, replicates are coming from. Is this is one of the principle of a true experiment. So if you do an experiment and just measure things only once, if you send such a paper to a journal, it will be rejected outrightly. Okay, then you have randomization. They say the usage of randomization to us to assign the treatment. And um, when this is just a big word to say that if you want to 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 sample the groups to do sampling, actually, you must do random sampling. You know, you want to sample the population of the study. It must be by random sampling. That's that's just all randomization is, is saying. You must use random sampling to to select the samples. Those people who are doing. Um, chemicals, uh, chemical analysis, microbiology, and stuff like that. For those who are doing microbiology, you always mix your inoculum before you plate. Those who are doing uh, biochemical, you always mix your chemical before you, you, you put them into the instrument. So that's part of the randomization you're doing without knowing, okay? That's randomization. Many people don't know that mixing is randomization that's why if you forget to mix you get uh, bias results so that's one of the principles of experimental design then they say local control most uh, scientific experiments have control so those who are doing science know what control is i can't overemphasize on that okay now let's look at survey survey design so we are still on experimental design. I mean, on research design. So we are done with experimental design. Now we are looking at survey design. Okay, survey design, I've, 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 I've listed five here. Cross-sectional survey. This is where you just go to a population at a particular point in time, interview them, collect data, and go away and never return. So we are doing a cross-sectional survey, okay? A longitudinal survey is the one whereby you go to a population, you conduct a survey from the same respondent. Then after a while, you return to them and, 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 and collect data again from after a period of time, you know? So that one is called longitudinal, longitudinal survey. Okay, repeated data collection on the same uh, respondent. You don't go to another group on the same group. You collect data from them over and over. Okay. Then you have qualitative survey research. Qualitative is mostly by uh, in-depth uh, data collection in the form of interview, yes, in the form of interview, to conduct interview. Then quantitative survey research is when you, you conduct a survey and, and, and collect numerical data. Okay, it's possible. I can conduct a survey to collect the ages and weight of people. And that data will be a numerical data whereby you can calculate mean and other stuff. So that's why some people, they have mixed method, qualitative and quantitative, especially those people who are doing uh, nutrition studies. I think they do, so they do a lot of survey and sometimes they collect numerical data, okay? I mean, if you're doing a survey on people, you, you measure their weight, you measure their height, 
you measure the body temperature, you know, you're, you're going to get numeric data. So a kind of a quantitative survey. Survey data can be collected on demographic, knowledge questions, performance questions, attitude questions. This is very important for people who are doing survey. Okay, you have demographic uh, questions whereby you collect demographic data, the social demographic data. Then some people, they, 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 they do a survey whereby they, they are checking the knowledge of respondents. Then your questions must be in the form of knowledge questions. But to test knowledge is, you must go by test. You must provide test questions to test knowledge. I don't know, some students, they use the Likert scale and they say they're testing knowledge. So it's, it's usually strange. Then performance questions to, to, to check the performance of people. Maybe you can use a checklist or something or ask them questions still. Then attitude questions you, for, to, 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 to investigate the attitude of people, you must ask attitude questions. For those who don't know, you must go and do a research on attitude questions. There are specific ways of asking attitude questions. You don't just ask. Some people, they ask knowledge questions, and then they'll say they are investigating, investigating attitude. They don't know the difference between attitude questions and knowledge questions. They are totally different. The way you pose the questions, I mean, the questions are different, and the response, the way the response a scale, the response scale is also different. Perception questions, awareness questions, opinion questions, and observation checklist. So people who are interested in survey, please investigate knowledge questions, how they are set up, performance questions, how they are set up, attitude questions, how they are being posed, and, and the answer options key, how it looks like, the same with perception questions, how the answer option scale looks like. The same with awareness. How do we pose awareness questions and how the answer, uh, the answer, the answer option scale looks like, or the answer options look like. So that's something that you need to, to check. It's, they are very different. So, so like I said, that most of the survey response skills are, are, are aligned with the type of, 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 of questions, you know. The response skills for knowledge questions is different from that of attitude, is different from that of perception. So you need to go and check them, okay? So there are just different type of scale, like the, the Kotomo scale, these are the yes or no, true and false scale, the rating scales, like the Likert scale, most of the rating scales are the ordinal scale. So that's something that you need to take note. Then you have the nominal scale. We've already talked about that one. The rating scale and the ordinal scale, we talked about that one. Semantic difference scales, okay, but very good. This can also be a rating scale. Open-ended response. So remember, we have open-ended whereby we ask people, what is your age? What is your, 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 your gross salary, you know, gross salary or gross income, something like that. Those are open expression. Okay, still on survey studies. So this is how you structure your questionnaire. You have section A, the social demographic, section B, Maybe you're talking about food safety knowledge, session C, you're talking about food safety attitude, session D, you're talking about food safety perception. Maybe you're doing sales, or the, instead of food safety knowledge, you say consumer knowledge on labeling, consumer attitude on labeling, something like that. So you have these various sections, and then you formulate the appropriate questions in each section, you know? Like this one, the first question will be A1, second question A2, and so on and so forth. Section B, you have B1, B2, B3. That's how you identify the questions. Because this is how you are going to capture it on Excel. A1 will be the first variable, A2 will be the second variable, and so on. Sampling and sample size. This is another big issue. 
is sample is a group. Okay, that you 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 you, you, you that you pick from a population. That's what it, that's the definition of a sample. Okay, some people they just guess sample size. I will use two hundred. Two hundred people will be will be picked from the population. And remember, not sample size is not only uh, from survey studies. Huh? Even those who are doing experiment, the number of samples that you want to subject into an experiment, you must think about it. Especially if you, you you want to analyze in groups, okay. So sample size is very important, especially in survey studies. The requirement for sample it must be representative of the population, so that you can generalize the findings from the research sample to the population. That is possible if you do random sampling, but if you can generalize. If you did not do random sample, you can generalize. So you can only talk about the what you see in terms of the the the, the, the sample size that you have. But you can generalize to say because it is like this in the sample, that is how it's going to be in the general population. No, you can only just discuss the relationship between variables, as as shown by the the research on that sample. Sample size must be compatible with the intended statistical analysis. So here again, you don't, you don't, you don't just uh, say, I'll use 100 respondent, 200 respondent. You must ask yourself that the type of analysis that I want to do, is it suitable for this sample size that I'm taking? For instance, if I do 10 sample, then I want to do a Chris Cavallis analysis or ANOVA. Is it going to be sufficient? Those are the questions that you must ask yourself. So to be on the safe side, you must use some kind of a scientific uh, 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 justification to determine a sample size. So some people, they use a sample size calculator to calculate their sample size. Then you must understand what the calculator gives you to be able to, to, to use a particular formula or calculator to calculate uh, your sample size. So most of the people, they use the Cochrane sample size formula. Cochrane sample size formula, which works for most of the, the, the studies whereby uh, samples were collected via random sampling. But sometimes it forms the basis for you to, to determine your sample size. So you must just think about it. You don't think about it from your head. You must go and read papers that are related to the type of, uh, to your research niche area, the type of research that you do, so that you know how people are calculating sample size there. Don't just indicate sample size from your imagination. It doesn't work like that. Okay, so this is the Cochrane's formula. You should go and check it out. I'm not going to say much about it. Then um, sampling plan. Okay, so now I want to look at different types of sampling actually. We have the probability sampling. This is another big one. Many students do not know the different type of sampling. They don't know, if you ask them what is a probability sampling, they don't know. If you ask them what's a proposal sampling, they don't know. What are the different types of probability sampling? They don't know. So now, pay attention. Types of sampling. Number one, we are looking at the probability sampling, otherwise known as random sampling or the lottery. Okay? So these are just big names for mixing mixing and then pick. So probability sampling, random sampling, simply means you mix and then you pick. Like you mix a pile of cut and then pick, okay? Or the lottery method, they mix the balls during the lottery 
and pick balls randomly. That is probability or random sampling. Simple random sample. Okay, a simple random sample is the one that you just mix and then you pick. Then now we come to the stratified sample. Okay. Stratified sampling means that the population is split into groups. Okay. So population must exist within an overall population. So you split the population into groups like toddler, like teenager, like male and female. But this is a, 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 a group that is already existing. But we are just trying to partition that group based on particular characteristics. So that's why you call a stratified random sample. Okay. And the groups are usually mutually exclusive. For instance, if I'm stratifying my population into male and female, surely I can't have a, a female that is a male. Yeah, I can't have someone who is a male at the same time a female in the context of random sampling. Okay, or race. If I'm, 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 I want to, to stratify my, my population into race, then I can have someone who belongs to more than one race. So this type of random sampling is the one where you first split the population into group. And then now you go to each group and do a, a, a simple random sampling. I hope that is clear. So we are conducting simple random sampling, but we must first split the population into groups. That's what I'm saying. Then the next one is the cluster random sampling. Okay. For cluster, I mean, if you, you just imagine the word cluster, cluster means things are just dotted here and there. Things are just dotted here and there. So like if you go into space, you see a cluster of forests, cluster of cities, you know? So the population is first split into groups, okay? The overall sample consists of members from the same group. Groups are selected at random. So clusters are naturally, uh, you, you, you are just exploiting groups that are, are formed by nature. You see, so these are naturally formed clusters. So you are exploiting geography. Let me just say geographical location. For instance, if I want to conduct a research in cities in South Africa, then I'll map out Johannesburg, I'll map out Cape Town, I'll map out Limpopo, I'll map out no, okay, Lipopo is not a city. Yeah, so I'll map out the major cities and then I'll do my random sampling within each city. So that's a kind of cluster sampling. Or if you are in Johannesburg, then you want to cluster the various suburbs. Okay. Then you have uh, something, then you have Randek, then you have uh, UV, you know. Then you have um, Marshall Town, and so on. So you can cluster them based on their geographical location for the purpose of sampling within each cluster. So that's the difference between cluster sampling and stratified sampling. So stratified is just to bring members of a population with a particular characteristics of interest and group them together before you sample. So to sample a population, to sample a population like Johannesburg, uh, stratified random sampling is not possible. You can do cluster sampling, but if you go to a school, you want to 
pick out grid one learners from grid two learners and group them. Then it's easy. Then you can do stratified random sampling. So I don't want to see people who are doing a study on a big city. And then they say they are doing they were they are going to do stratified random sampling. You see. So there are many students who are making uh, errors like this. So you must know that cluster is mostly for a, a, a vast geographical area. We do cluster sampling. But for satisfying random sampling, it's for a population that is handy, whereby you can partition them. So a school, a nursery school, a church, so such population you can do satisfied random sampling there. Okay, systematic random sampling. This is uh, a kind of a random sampling in which there is, uh, what do we call it? There's some kind of a, an orderly pattern in which the members are picked from the population. For instance, if the, the people are, are lined up in a row, or if they have a list of people in a register, I can come to a school and say, I want to sample every fifth learner in this class. So I'll go to the register, I'll start to count one, number five, come out, number 10, come out. And so, so if I, I'm doing that, that is a random sampling, but it's a kind of a systematic random sampling. Not even the register. Like you can have a group of people and see, and 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 you pick the first one, you, you pick every five. So you mix the population, mix the population, you pick number one, you don't take. Mix, mix, you pick number two, you don't take. You mix, you pick number three, you don't take. Mix, you pick number four, you don't take. You pick number five, you take. You six, you don't take. You reach the tenth, you take. You mix. So you are, you are mixing after each picking. Okay. Something like that. So there are many, you, you can go and read about systematic random sampling. So there's a pattern that is used to do the random sampling. But you must know that at each time you must mix the population. Because a ra a random sampling is based on the fact that mixing takes place before the sampling. Okay, sampling plan, non, non probability sampling. This one is very direct. Quota sampling means you just divide the group into quota you know, and, 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 and take a few. Convenient sampling means you take those that have a certain characteristics that you want. Proposal sampling is still almost the same thing. You pick those that you want. Convenient sampling is you pick those that are available. Proposal sampling means you pick those that you want. Self-selection sampling means people can nominate themselves. Snowball sampling means that if I pick you purposefully, I can ask you to bring another person to come and participate or to, to tell me who can participate, you know? So that will be a snowball sampling. Okay, let's look at uh, types of data. I'm seeing there are basically two types of data that can emanate from the measurement of variables. We've already touched this on the type of scale, the quantitative scale and qualitative scale. Okay, so for quantitative, we say we can have continuous data and, and, and discrete data. So we've touched on this. Then for non-numeric, which is the qualitative, we have the nominal data and the original data. So I'm not going to talk too much on this. So the type of the type of scale there we we're talking about scale. Now we are talking about data. So I said the type of data and the type of scale are almost synonymous. You know, they're synonyms. If it's a nominal data, it's going to be a nominal scale. Okay. So this is how we capture data on Excel, where you have A, B, C, D, E, that's where you put the variables, and then from one to three, so the first respondent, second respondent. 
okay or first experiment second experiment depending on whether you are doing an experiment or you are doing a survey so it's basically the same thing so you can look at excel spreadsheet and see how you capture data you can do it a simple google show a uh, youtube search you see many videos on that okay thank you it has been a while for this lecture but it's a it's a very important lecture that i hope that um, all of you learn from this and listen to part of the lecture you can listen to it over and over again and and try to understand the concept okay so I hope this uh, will help you in achieving your goal of writing a proper research proposal. Thank you very much.